Welcome everybody to this session on remote monitoring. My name is Dirian and I'm the product manager for Pro Polar Monitoring at Electromechanica. Joining me today is Mike. Thanks Dirian. Yeah, so I'm Mike and I'm uh, the head of business development at, product, at Polar Monitoring. And uh, today we're going to be taking you through what, what, what my company does and uh, how, we, how we can actually assist in remote monitoring in the field. No, great, Mike. But before we start, uh, some house rules. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, at the end, we'll do a Q&A session where you can unmute your mic. You just put your hand up and uh, we'll unmute you so that you can ask the questions directly to us. So Mike, you mentioned remote monitoring. What is remote monitoring, especially in this day and age where there's buzzwords such as IoT, IoT, 4IR, it's very confusing. Thanks, Duren. So yeah, so there is uh, unfortunately a lot of uh, different buzzwords that are happening in the industry today. There is a definite growing trend in trying to gather data from, from the field and trying to present it online. Um, and what really remote monitoring is, is just that. So we are trying to gather data from the field and present it into an online platform where you can then obviously trend it and track it and start using that data to benefit your uh, your systems. Oh, great, Mike. And where would you use remote monitoring? Right, so generally speaking, we would use remote monitoring in areas that are not easily accessible, that you're not really going to all the time or that for interest sake, it takes time to actually get there. So having these kind of uh, devices there that can actually gather that information that's on site and uh, present it online so that you don't actually have to go there anymore now um, is, is, is what the benefit of remote monitoring actually is. Um, we're trying to stop the, the, your farm or something like that driving out to a borehole, spending time there. Generally, some, some of these guys, unfortunately, spending most of their days just driving between pumps and different areas on the site to actually see what's happening and make sure that uh, everything's running like it should. Definitely. And so when it comes to remote monitoring, where does Polar play in, in this field? Right. So in terms of Polar monitoring, we manufacture really three devices. Okay. And then our, our last actual product offering is our cloud platform. Mm -hmm. So in terms of devices, we have what we call our LTE gateway. And uh, this is a RS485 communications gateway. Um, and it essentially will plug into a number of controllers in the field and uh, present that controller's data online, right? In the event that those controllers do not have RS-485 communications, we then have what we call our field bus module over here, which is essentially our middleman. And it takes data from other types of sensors, say that have uh, analog inputs or pulse counter or pulse output type uh, uh, sensors, um, and actually puts that data into a form that our gateway can then read. And uh, that will then send it online to our polar monitoring cloud. Oh, great. So an example would be if you have like a flow meter in the field or pressure transmitter measuring the level in a borehole, you could basically convert that, that information from 4 to 20 to uh, Modbus and then take it to the cloud, correct? Yes, exactly like that. The idea is, is that obviously these are, are, are stuff that's permanently installed in the field and we can actually just uh, gather that information again through our field bus module presented online. Absolutely. Okay. Great. So, so basically what you're presenting here um, is fantastic, but what separates this from an actual PLC? Right. So that's actually a very good question um, and one that we get off, asked quite often. Um, the polar monitoring system is purely a, a like telemetry system. Okay. What this means is that we are not doing logical based controls at all through this. Okay. PLCs have their, their place. They are very important in controlling and, and uh, even locally monitoring applications. Um, but where we are trying to play here is that this is like between somebody reading the physical reading on a site, writing it down, and actually a PLC type system that's okay. giving per second data or millisecond type mm -hmm. data. Okay. This system is more for you want generic tracking and trending of information that you can see what's happening over time and make better decisions. Great. So as you, you said, you know, PLC costs money. The system, I'm assuming, costs money. Won't this just drive up the running cost of, of a plant? Absolutely. So with this system, obviously, it will add extra costs to the installation, extra costs to the actual um, hardware that's going into the field. Um, what's, what the plan is here is that we're trying to actually save on the indirect costs. Mm -hmm. right? So yes, you've paid more for the installation. Yes, you've paid more for the hardware. 
but now we're saving you money by not going into SART anymore. Mm -hmm. You now no longer have to go there for every problem that somebody's discovered. You can actually log in, see that kind of information online now and make a call from there. Um, so yeah, so to be long story short, it does obviously cost you a bit extra, but in the indirect costs that you're gonna save over the five, 10 years that you're gonna use a system like this, it, it, to, be, to me, it, it feels like a no brainer. Oh no, fantastic. I know you mentioned the, the controller, the converter, but what actually does the system look like? If I have a borehole in my plant or in, in, on my farm with just a few uh, 420 and a drive, how does the system look? Absolutely, okay. So in terms of the actual hardware, you'll see that there's no physical screen or anything like this. Um, the whole idea is, is that this is all accessible through the cloud, okay? But when I say cloud, what I mean is, is that you can log into a physical website, well, onto Polar Monitoring's website, um, or download the Polar Monitoring app, and you can actually see these kind of 4 to 20 milliamp levels or statuses on your variable speed drive or something like that on your phone or on this website remotely, okay? So just like, I guess, an HMI on a, P on a PLC, it's showing you basic readings. We are actually doing the next step and converting those readings into usable data, where that instead of giving us a four to 20 reading that uh, may mean something to some, but not to everybody, we're giving a physical head height of water okay. or a physical bar pressure reading or KPA reading or something like that, that is now usable for you as the end user. Okay, so in terms uh, to get you right, the, the ecosystem would look if, in the example that I presented. I have my borehole with my pressure transmitter, I have my drive. Obviously, the drive will have Modbus out, so I'd use just the straight communication. If I didn't have Modbus, I'd obviously connect it to the converter to convert it to Modbus. Then it goes to the gateway, and then where does it go? So it's obviously LTE or Ethernet, but does it just go into the vastness of space? Absolutely. So we do have, uh, yeah, so each of these devices, the LTE version actually has a SIM card in it, right? And uh, this then sends the data that it's collecting through to our cloud. Um, once the cloud is, uh, it, it, the cloud will then do all the conversion and, uh, and uh, analyzation of this data. Um, but yes, in terms of your model now, the gateway would plug directly into our drive, mm -hmm. right? From there, you would daisy chain our RS-485 cable to the actual um, field bus module where you would then plug in your various sensors into the field bus module and you would gain the information then directly from the drive. So that's, I mean, there'll be everything that the drive can actually show you on the site. Mm -hmm. And then the information that the drive isn't monitoring, so your, your, your pressure reading or your uh, level reading or something like that would come from the field bus module directly. Oh no, great. And I know you mentioned LTE and ethernet and there's a lot of talk out there about like Sigfox and LoRaWAN that's there. Is there, you know, is this the only communications that you guys have, or are these just buzzwords that are out there in the in the market? Yes. So in the market at the moment, there's many different ways of actually gathering, or, or, or very many different, let's call it transfer methods that are going from the from the these devices in the field to actual online platforms, right? So there is Sigfox, there is LoRaWAN, there is what they call LoRa. There's a whole different uh, set of buzzwords mm. that are really um, out there. We found that with Polar, we've got on the GSM route, which is a uh, cellular based communications. And um, because we've, we've seen in South Africa and generally sub-Saharan Africa, there's really good cell, cell phone network coverage. Um, so actually going with these type of devices, especially again for our powered application, we, we, we find that it's actually one of the most reliable and consistent methods of sending the data from, from these gateways in the field to our cloud. Okay, no, great. And uh, in terms of the uh, coverage, you mentioned that it covers, but is it one specific network, for instance, or uh, does it do roaming? Say, for instance, especially nowadays with cell phone, uh, cell phone towers, uh, uh, you know, in the news where batteries get stolen or uh, a cell phone does go down, is the system able to latch onto another tower or does the system just go dead? Right. So. Thankfully, so what we've done on our end is that we actually manage the SIM cards mm -hmm. directly through our Polar Cloud as well. Um, and these, when I say SIM card, I mean, they, there isn't a physical SIM card in this yeah. device. It's a, what we call a chip SIM. Mm -hmm. um, and what this does is it actually, with our providers, we actually are able to connect to any network in, in the country, right? Yeah. So, which is nice about it, as well as that we can then use the same provider to connect to any network in the sub-Saharan African region as well. So in the sense of like, unfortunately now with the load shedding that's happening, 
we do have towers that have started to go down. Um, and what's nice is that this system will then switch over to a new tower or say the Vodacom in the area goes bad, it'll then move over to an MTN type network um, when, that, when that does go down. Um, so yeah, so thankfully again, in these kind of scenarios, we do have backups for that as well. Um, but I think also it's important to mention here that we don't really use that much data through our system, right? So yes, we're monitoring a lot of data, but in terms of actual megabyte size, there's not a crazy amount going through here. So even a generally a very bad network that like you can generally like sort of make a phone call kind of network, our system will, will function pretty pretty well. Okay. So as long as my, my cell phone is operational and even picks up one bar, information can be transferred. Yes, yeah. So what, what is nice about it is that we obviously do have an antenna in these systems as well. And it's not small, a small antenna. It's generally uh, something that can be large. You can put it up quite high, which generally helps a lot with uh, getting better cell phone reception. Okay. And what about Africa? You know, we have a lot of customers or clients that operate across the border. Is the system able to, or is it just a South African application that we can use this in? Right. So, yes. Yeah. So we do have coverage for the full sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the, the beauty of it is that we do actually, so we'll actually have a different product code for the SIMs that do go across border but we do have coverage in those areas as well. Um, again, we are limited, unfortunately, by the cellular networks, um, which generally, like I said earlier, is, is pretty good in, uh, in the sub-Saharan African region. So we, we're pretty confident in most areas we'll be able to actually use the system. Oh, no, great. And I know you mentioned that, um, you know, the SIM is managed. So I know there's a lot of systems in the market whereby you have to uh, actually install your own SIM card and manage the data. And this can be quite challenging, especially if you forget to load data and then you're not getting the information back. Am I correct in saying there's no management of the SIM whatsoever, data costs, buying of data whatsoever? Yeah, so we've tried to take the hassle again. The whole idea is we're trying to be as simple as possible. Um, to bring it back to the PLCs, it takes a lot to install. It's difficult. You need to know what you're doing to make sure that it's going to work properly, right? With the SIM card side, we've done that as well we've taken the management of the SIM cards completely out of the equation. We actually do the data management, the, connecti the connectivity, the SMSs, anything that there's really going to be charged on the, on the SIM card, we actually are already, already doing in the back end as well. So the client won't have to reca anything. They'll never have to uh, add any data or worry about connection because they didn't have any, say, airtime or something like that. So yeah, so we've covered all of that, those bases as well. Oh no, great. And typically, you know, you talk a, a, a good game. You mentioned ease of installation. How easy is it to install this? Right, so we've tried to make it, again, yeah, as easy as possible to install. Um, the system itself, look, we, we can't make it completely uh, very simple, but it's as simple as it can be in our, in our point of view. Um, the actual hardware itself has two sets of inputs. So we've got actually three sets of inputs, I guess, if you want to get technical. There's two for power, so you'll plug in uh, your 12 to 24 volt DC, you'll plug in the RS485 communications to your controller. Um, and then finally, you'll screw the, the antenna into the, the, the SMA. And uh, that's pretty much the, that on the installation side. Um, when the device gets power, it'll automatically connect to our cloud, right? And in terms of setting that up with your password and, and like your actual um, logins, um, when you get to the website the first time, it'll ask you to create an account. Once you've created that account, you'll be able to scan. You'll see on the front of all of our units, there's a unique QR code. When you scan that QR code with say your phone camera or something like that, it'll automatically start linking and, and begin the setup process now through the, the Polar Monitoring Cloud. Um, and what that really looks like is, it'll just link the serial number to your account. Once the serial number is linked, it'll ask you what device you've then attached the, the gateway to. And uh, from there, um, we have again mapped all the registers and done all the, 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 the nitty gritty difficult stuff in our back end as well. So if it's a device that we have on our, on our uh, supported devices list, um, it'll then just connect to that device and start pulling the registers that, uh, that are on the system. Great. No, so paint me a picture, Mike. Um, so we've set this whole system up. It's gone to the cloud. What does this cloud actually look like? What do I see when I'm connected to the system? Absolutely. So you'll have, uh, you'll generally have obviously your, your devices list, right? So mm -hmm. when you log on for the first time, you won't have any devices linked. 
once you've linked a whole bunch of devices, you'll have a device list that'll show you everything that's that's uh, linked to your profile. And you'll be able to go into these devices individually, like onto their dashboard and actually see the readings on a live screen um, to see what's happening on these controllers in the field, right? So when I say device, when I say controller, I mean the things that this gateway is connected okay. to. Okay, just so we're on the same page yeah. there. Um, we are obviously also then tracking these, these uh, readings then historically as well. So you can then start seeing all your trending data. Um, and the, the, the final part that we have then on the system is then our alert functionalities and notification functionalities, whereby you can set high level, low level type alerts. And in some of the more advanced controllers like your generator controller or, or your variable speed drives, we'll actually be able to see the physical faults and errors and uh, uh, states that these controllers are now in as well. Um, and present that to you on the, either on the cloud, or you can set up a notification that when there's a state change or a fault or something like that, that it would send you an SMS or an email to tell you what's actually happened on the site. Oh, fantastic. So, you know, I know we talk a lot about agriculture and you mentioned agricultural applications, but like I have, I think I have a remote monitoring system at home whereby I have a Giza timer. I'm able to um, access the Giza timer by an app I'm able to monitor my consumption, for instance, switch it on, switch it off, set certain times, especially when there's load shedding. And I'm thinking, what about like generators, especially now and again, or actually, especially now when there's load shedding, a lot of people are using generators. And we actually recently had a phone call about uh, two weeks ago when load shedding started again, um, this customer had his, uh, he wanted a system whereby he could actually monitor other inputs of his, just not his generator, but for instance, the battery voltage. And in this situation, his plant was shut down for two to three hours because his battery was down while he had to source a new battery. Is this something that we could use remote monitoring for? Yes. So that's kind of the whole idea behind our system as well. So we are monitoring everything that the controllers can give. Mm -hmm. So in general, your smaller generators will, will have an onboard type controller that won't really be able to be monitored. But in your bigger generator applications, they will have a, uh, a, a larger controller that then has our RS485 communications yeah. or has a module that can give these kind of communications out. Um, and from there, we can start seeing, again, those battery voltages, say even as far as like your fuel levels or something like mm -hmm. that. And uh, with the alert functionality, we could set a high level or a low level alert that if your battery did go too low, so in this application, it would have actually been perfect. If we set a low level alert, we would have then been able to detect when the battery went flat, send an email, send an SMS to the, to the relevant parties, and then obviously sort the battery out before it became a problem. Mm -hmm. um, we do exactly the same with the fuel level as well. So it's nice to obviously get a good, uh, the, the generator's fuel levels below 30%, mm -hmm. and it gives you time now to go and actually sort that out. Oh, great. What about, could I use this potentially as a redundant system? I know a lot of applications, for instance, refrigeration plants actually have a monitoring system and data centers actually monitor temperature and relative. Could I use the system as a redundant system? Yes. Yeah, so we have in polar monitoring, we kind of have two or three different types of business models. Um, one is obviously being a sole monitoring solution mm -hmm. on the site. But like you do say, with these bigger refrigeration plants and data center kind of thing, the controls that are on site are also monitoring the system. Okay. In a lot of these applications, they are not necessarily um, monitored then now remotely. So as soon as somebody's left the site, they then will have the issue that they won't know what's happening until the morning yeah. or like if, or if they go home for the weekend or something like that, that nobody knows what the issue is until they get back to work on Monday. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, so the system can at least, in those circumstances be used as an ad hoc or an addition to the to the current on-site um, system uh, whereby we can start sending those alerts mm -hmm. and actually just doing the the general almost like a second check to make sure that everything's ah. running like it should oh, great um uh, we did touch on uh, load shedding but in terms of signal strength when there's load when there is load shedding the system does operate as per normal yeah, so luckily, because of obviously the moving over between different networks and that kind of connectivity, um, it is it is uh, it, it will move over okay. and obviously keep a signal. Good. And in terms of device integration, we mentioned, um, for instance, we, we can input 4 to 20 for any uh, device, uh, VFDs, we mentioned data centers, but 
What about other devices? Is there any other devices that could integrate into the system? Yes. Yeah, so on Polar Monitoring's website, if you head to the support section, you'll find a list of supported devices that uh, uh, we, we have on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. What this means is that we've done the physical mapping and integration yeah. of the registers ourselves mm -hmm. um, so that it is really a plug and play type solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've also built in a full wiki page that you can also access to show you how to um, how to physically install our gateway yeah. to those physical devices in the field or those controllers. Um, but if you do have a sensor or a device type that has the style of communication, yeah. but isn't actually on our supported device mm -hmm. list, you we uh, have what's called our generic pod bus type sensor, mm -hmm. where if you do know enough about the system or know enough about at least the registers and the mappings of those registers on your end, that you can actually input those mm -hmm. registers directly into our cloud and it'll then pull the, the, the data you're looking for online. Mm -hmm. um, what's nice about that is that obviously we don't have to get fully involved in that, um, but if it's the device that's going to be used in the future or a device that, say, you would for interest sake see a lot of promise in, mm -hmm. you can then obviously get a hold of us and, and almost, we, if there's enough time, we can obviously implement that as a permanent addition to the, to the polar monitoring system. Great. Uh, you keep on saying ease of use, ease of use, but what if I'm actually just the layman? A normal guy on the street, no electrical experience. Is there any guides that you have that can help me with this installation and hooking the system up into the cloud? Absolutely. So in terms of um, assisting our clients, the, the system has always been built around the end user, mm -hmm. right? When we originally made it, we were in the agricultural sector. Um, and a lot of guys are unfortunately not so tech savvy in these sectors, which is, which is absolutely fine. Um, but we built it around trying to, to be that bridge between I'm going to physically go and see the site and now wanting to use it online, yeah. right? So we've tried to like create it and, and make it as user-friendly as possible just as a start. But now we've also gone the extra step to create YouTube videos, create kind of how-to guides mm -hmm. that are going to assist clients if they ever do need help. Um, and obviously with the integration with Electromechanica now, we've obviously trained up their technicians and trained up the EM uh, assistants so that if somebody does call and need any assistance on the, on, on the Polar Cloud, that they will be able to assist with that. All right, no, great. Um, you talk, once again, I, I keep on saying you're talking a big game because it honestly feels and sounds too good to be true. But, you know, let's get down to the nitty gritties. What does a system like this cost? Because I can tell you, I've seen a lot of systems on the market and they can be exorbitant. Absolutely. So look, so Polar Monitoring is a South African made co uh, company. We do everything in, in our actual own capacity. Mm -hmm. So we don't come with those dollar type prices. Yeah. Okay. What, what is then to be fair, it does sound a bit ridiculous that we do work on as many different systems as possible. Mm -hmm. We have seen that there are all these OEMs that are making their own clouds, their own monitoring platforms that specifically work with their devices, mm -hmm. right? We've tried to like transcend those different device types yeah. and stuff. Like, yes, we, we support specific devices, but our vision at Polo is to try and be, be encompassing of as many devices and as many device types as possible, okay? okay? In terms of pricing, we are what I, I would, I would uh, consider ourselves to be reasonable, mm -hmm. okay? We're not trying to be the cheapest out there, but we also obviously know our place in the markets, right? So we're not charging PLC type prices, but again, we're not doing obviously the logical base control mm -hmm. side. So in terms of our actual gateway, the LTE gateway is 2,880 Rand okay. as, the, as the list price within Electromechanica, mm -hmm. okay? Important to just say as well is that Electromechanica is our sole distributor of this product mm -hmm. as well. Um, so if anybody does want to get hold, get uh, their hands on this product, they'll, they can go directly through EM. Okay. Um, so yeah, so 2,885 Rand, for the, uh, the, the LTE gateway. I mentioned earlier that we also have an ethernet based mm -hmm. gateway, which is really just exactly the same as this, exactly the same in functionality. All that's different is that it doesn't have a SIM card now, um, and it actually needs then an on-site mm -hmm. internet connection. So you'll plug in an ethernet um, or a, a LAN cable into it to actually um, to connect to the cloud. Yeah. Um, and that unit is 1,572 Rand, mm -hmm. okay? Um, then obviously our last, uh, our second last uh, unit, is our field bus module, which we've again dubbed our middleman. Yeah. Um, and it is also the same price as the LTE gateway, it's 2,885 Rand. Mm -hmm. um, and these are one sort of hardware fees, okay. okay? With our cloud platform, and, and because it's our main offering, 
is that we actually do charge a software licensing fee, okay? okay? And this lot, so this software license fee is actually charged per gateway in the field. Okay. okay. So any LTE gateway or Ethernet gateway that gets purchased will have to be purchased with what we call our standard software license. Okay. And this software licensing fee is two thousand eight hundred and eighty rand per year. Okay. Okay. So this is to the cloud. This is so the portal. Exactly okay. that. So that's to get to the portal. Mm -hmm. Um. Again, like I mentioned earlier, we manage all the SIM cards and all the data and all the transmissions and everything that's included in that. We just throw that in as part of our service offering. Yeah. Yes, you're getting the software, but again, for the LTE version, you're also getting that SIM card and everything that's included with us. Okay. okay. No, great. But what if I wanted to, before buying it, just trial out the system? Is there is there an option to trial the system out? Yes. Yeah, so in terms of trialing, we do have, if the hardware is purchased, right, we have what we call a three-month trial license um, where a, a user will be able to plug the system in, connect it up to their controller, and for the next three months from setup, they'll be able to then use the system, um, at which end point uh, it'll then turn the SIM card off and turn, the, the obviously, your access to the cloud mm -hmm. off as well. Um, but then, obviously, if, you, if you're happy with the system, you can then go on to purchase the license separately um through through electromechanica okay so no great so in conclusion just to wrap up it's easy to install it's device agnostic it uh you have options such as lte and ethernet as well uh and if a customer has a application that's not one that's in on the website they can get a hold of electromechanica or polar monitoring directly to assist them yes yeah so we, again we've made it as simple as possible well, as simple as we can make it mm -hmm. um, in the hopes that it's a no-brainer. You can install it on any device and get as much information to you as possible and ultimately just improve improve your uh, your your functionality. No, great. Thank you, Mike. Um, so maybe we'll just go to some questions that we have in the, the PINA. Yep, sure. First question uh, we've got uh, was from George Ho. Um, just asking the LTE GSM architecture you're using, are you using 4G LTE or is it 2G? Um, and also what network band are you going to use by MTN? Perfect. Thanks, George. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, the, the actual GSM connectivity, so our modem will connect to 2G and it'll connect to the LTE networks. Um, in terms of the actual GSM bands, you'll be able to pull that information actually from our, uh, our user manual online, um, just because there's obviously a wide variety of bands but the main one is that the lte band that we're using is called lte cat one okay so i think that'll answer his question i see uh, jim Fremantle states um this is a hardware cost what is the monthly cost effectively the gsm cost <clears throat> right so yeah so again the hardware fee is a one source fee okay the gsm cost is actually just a, a cost that we've absorbed into our software licensing fee okay so Yes, you can use the Ethernet based version of this as well, or you can use the LTE slash SIM card based version. The software licensing fee is the same. We just find that generally the LTE version is so much easier to set up. Um, so that really just helps in just getting people to use the LTE mm -hmm. version rather than the, the Ethernet version. But really, sometimes the cost of the actual hardware then is offset um, because obviously the LTE is more expensive. So in, in, in the short answer, don't worry about the GSM costs. Don't worry about the data costs. It's included in the software license fee. Great. I see Jacques Dreyer asks, how is the portal configured? Can we show him an example or an existing demo? I think maybe I can answer that, hmm. uh, Jacques. Maybe you can get in touch with uh, ourselves. I think we have your contact details. What we can do is we we'll set up an actual demo uh, for you with various examples to show you the access to the portal and the demo. Um, yeah, that hope that answers idea. your question, Jacques. For, or you can go on YouTube, there is actually a video showing the portal and how it is configured uh, at, uh, under the Electromechanica uh, playlist. Um, SAS to Plexi, basically uh, you asked, uh, I don't see a solo monitoring app on the app store. Okay, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so we are using what's called a web-based app. Okay, so you will not find polar monitoring in the app store. Um, but at the same time, when you do go onto the Polar Monitoring, or sorry, the, the actual website link is portal.polarmonitoring.com. Um, when you go onto that for the first time, you will see that it'll ask you to then download the app to your phone, okay? The reason we've done this is for actually for version control, so that we can make sure that, again, because we're permanently updating mm -hmm. the system and making sure that everybody's using the right versions, um, we've gone to this web app 
type uh, type setup, which really helps to make sure that the next time you open the app, it's already downloaded the latest version. Um, and there isn't a moment that you've now disabled your downloads or something like that and fighting me about why you can't actually access the, the, the device that you've, you've, you've bought. Um, so yeah, so there is actually also on our Polar Wiki, you can go there and actually search for how to add the app to your phone. Um, and it'll then give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to actually uh, download and install the app on your phone. But essentially in terms of functionality, it works and functions exactly like a normal phone app. Um, and it's actually just a nice scaled down version of the website you'll see on the on the PC. Great. Okay, I hope that answers that question. I see Rob de Oliveira uh, asks, data refresh time on the cloud. How often or how current is the data on the cloud? Okay, so this is actually a two part now. So as I mentioned earlier, we have what we call the live screen, right? Okay. So when you go onto the device dashboard for the first time or every time you load the device dash um, on the cloud, it'll have what we call as a live screen, okay? Mm -hmm it'll go and actually pull the data now directly from the controller in the field, right? So that'll be as close to live as, as the, the cell phone networks will allow us, okay? And it'll actually automatically refresh every, every 30 seconds to a minute on, uh, on that side, okay? And then obviously we are monitoring and, and logging data then um, historically as well, and we go down to five minute poll intervals, okay? So what that means is that every five minutes, our cloud fires off a, a check to all the readings kind of question, and it brings all that data back, stores it, and that'll happen every five minutes. Okay, so there is a way to now change how often you, you read that data as well. So like a case in point is, I know with power factor correction, the controllers actually give out a weekly power factor correction uh, reading. You don't need to check the weekly power factor every five minutes. It obviously only updates at a, at a rolling average or once a week. So those kind of things we'd read on a five minute, on, a, on an hourly or a 12 hourly kind of reading or daily type reading, because it's not as, as urgent, but small things like you want to see what time the pump started, you would go down to a five minute type reading, okay? Oh, great. Uh, I see Nigel, is there a demo site where we can have a play? Okay, so at the moment, Nigel, unfortunately we do not have a demo site. We're working on that. Um, so in the next, say, two to three weeks, I think that that demo site will then be going online um, and you'll then be able to access some basic devices and uh, see see what's like kind of the, the gist of the platform. So you'll be able to see a live screen, your historical screen, um, play with the alert setup, but it won't really obviously be functional in the, in the, in the sending you of alerts. But my, my advice would be the unit price is not exorbitant. Buy a unit, play with a three month trial, um, if you don't like it, it's, it, maybe it's not for you, but nine times out of 10, it, it kind of, uh, it works in the application. Okay. Um, I see Arthur is asking if communication GSM does go down, is there local logging? Okay. So thanks for that, that question. Um, so no, at the moment, we do not have local logging on our, on our gateways. Um, we have found that the, the GSM networks, and again, because we're using such small amount of data that we do have very consistent data. But if there's truly no network in the area when that does go or a network tower does go down and we can't physically get connection, our device will then no longer obviously be logging. Okay. When just important to say as well, when it does now connect again, or uh, if the networks do come back, it'll then start uh, logging again. Obviously, as soon as the tower comes back, it will start reading. Um, but just as a secondary on the actual field bus module, the pulse counters will always save. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if the device goes off, obviously it's not really reading anything, but if the network connectivity goes down and your water meter is still turning, it'll save those pulse counts for the water meter uh, locally on the device. Okay. But unfortunately, that is the only one that's, that, that is actually saved locally. Okay, okay. Um, I see uh, Zuneid is, how fast is the poll register or how fast can I uh, pull the register? Okay, Zunaid, so the limit on the poll registers is down to five minutes. Um, we generally set them anywhere from an hour to five minute readings. Um, and that just means that we are logging now at five minute intervals throughout the, yeah, in your, in your day. Okay. okay. And I see Simon's asking about the dashboard. Is the dashboard customizable um, or is it just the standard dashboard that you do get? Can I put a dashboard uh, or I should say, can he put a dashboard on multiple sites, create a dashboard on multiple sites? Okay, Simon, thank you for that. Um, so there's, we, we essentially have two dashboards on the system. Okay, the one is the generic device dashboard, right? So if you've bought a electricity meter and you set it up for the first time, the dashboard that we show you will be your default dashboard. Okay, it'll be a bunch of 
tiles on there that are showing you live readings. Okay. Um, those are customizable to the point that we are say showing the five most important tiles uh, that we that we feel is the 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 a good starting point. Mm -hmm. You can obviously go in then and add as many tiles, or actually you can then go and add additional tiles to monitor additional registers on the on the electricity meter, right? But we've also then created what we call our custom dashboard functionality, mm -hmm. where that if you have multiple devices in the field, um, that you can bring basic data from each of them into one place okay so the system again one day you will see is that it's very device specific orientated so you'll go into each device individually see the data there go to the next device see the data there mm -hmm. but we've now created that uh, that uh, custom dashboard function that you can bring basic information from each device into one page yeah okay i see okay. rian's asking uh he assumes that you can have multiple users or is there a limit Okay, so yeah, so our uh, gate, our uh, software licensing fee is charged per gateway in the field. Okay, so it's not actually about the number of users or anything like that. So realistically, you can have as many users logging into a device as you want. They'll obviously have to have their own unique usernames and passwords. Mm -hmm. And we will send as many email and SMS notifications as you need to however many users you need for that specific device. Okay. Um, so I think you answered the yeah, second so question there. Yeah, sorry. Guys... So I saw your second question as mm -hmm. well. So it was uh, for alarm notifications. How many SMSs or emails do you say get a month? At the moment, that is actually unlimited. Mm -hmm. We've set this up again. Part of our software licensing fee is that there's nothing that's an add-on or anything like that. So you will just add as many users to the system as you want to, and as many users will get the SMSs and emails as you want to. So maybe a question uh, just to add on to Rian is uh, how many tags? So you mentioned you mentioned unlimited users, but tags to the system? That's a good one as well. So the gateways are limited currently to 32 tags, mm -hmm. okay? And that's per software license. What this means is that we can either have, say, because again, because this device is uh, RS485 based, mm -hmm. we can connect a number of different uh, actual controllers to one gateway, yeah. okay? So we've also limited the, the system to 32 tags per license, okay? What that means is that we can either monitor one reading from 32 different electricity meters yeah. or one generator controller or something like that monitoring 32 different monitoring points. Okay. okay. Um, so I hope that answers that question as well. Perfect. Anonymous, basically, uh, there's a question here. Is there an API to link uh, a third party SCADA system um, in? Okay. So in terms of APIs, um, we've actually built this entire platform from scratch. Um, so if there is an API type question or something like that, that you guys need to set up to a skater or something like that, we can definitely have that discussion. Mm -hmm. I think the next step would be there is this to get hold of uh, one of the guys at Electromechanica and they can push that directly onto us because obviously we would have to then set up that API in the back end um, for you to then use. Um, I see Zanid asking about a user question here. In terms of, is there a password control or user levels in the system? Okay, so that's also a very important one for us. So obviously data security and everything around that uh, stems basically from the user at a start, okay? Each person gets a username and password that's unique to them, okay? From there, we actually have different user levels, yeah. okay? So starting from the bottom, we have what we call a notification uh, type user level, which is like a, a, you can't even log into the platform. It's purely just to get your email and your uh, phone number so you can send SMSs. From up, up, a one up from that is like a, a read only type access that you can't even push buttons on the mm -hmm. platform. You can see basic graphs and stuff. Um, we then have your, your user access, which will then assist your users and your, your generic users that will be wanting to stop start pumps or wanting to control different stuff, setting up alert notifications, that kind of thing. Um, and then the final one is actually then a technician um, level where we can actually start getting to the, into the remote programming of the controllers that we've plugged into the system, okay? okay? So because we're obviously communicating through the mod, uh, through the Modbus or RS485, um, a lot of these controllers can like a, like a variable speed drive, you can actually adjust a number of parameters and registers mm -hmm. um, through the system as well. So okay. we've essentially built that technician role that anything you can do on the actual controller locally, you can now do through the cloud as well. Okay, okay. so Zane, just to bring that back, sorry, that got a little bit long-winded. Yes, we do have password controlled user access levels. Um, there's everything from that you can't even access the platform to you can program devices remotely. Okay. Maybe, maybe a question from me would be, um, you mentioned in terms of the control levels, 
am I able to, for instance, a generator application or a drive application start and stop the, the generator remotely? Uh, uh, is it bi-directional or only one direction? Yes, yeah, so in terms of pumps and generators and stuff, you can remotely stop and start them. Um, with, uh, with the remote stop and start, you'd have to be a user level or above mm -hmm. um, because obviously we want to limit access to, to that kind of stuff. But what one has to be careful with what kind of permissions you're giving to people as well, because you're essentially giving the keys to the site yeah. to now do whatever you want on there. So very important that when you do create the user access to your to your different people in the company, that you make people read only that should be read only. You don't want people starting and stopping stuff when they shouldn't be. Okay. Okay, great. Um, Arthur's asked you for the other attendees, how are third party Modbus devices supported? Um, okay. I think that's a follow-up question yes. um, from a previous question that we we got in terms of does the gateway only communicate on um, Modbus uh, RS 4.5? Okay. Yes. So yes. Yeah. So obviously the system communicates on Modbus RS 4.5. Um, Polar monitoring's main focus is obviously on the electromechanical systems as well. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, the idea behind our system is to try and be as encompassing as possible. Okay. In, the, in, a, in, a, in a nice world, everybody would be using the same type of product and we can all monitor it and be happy with ourselves. But it, unfortunately, in the real world, different people had different prices at the time and now factories are, are using different types of equipment mm. all over the place. So in terms of third-party devices, we do support a, a wide variety of third-party devices that are not included in the electromechanical catalog. Um, those are generally, again, you'll find that on our supported devices list. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so there is a, a wide number of devices that we do support outside of the electromechanical catalog. But in terms of uh, uh, the catalog itself, we do support any device in the electromechanical catalog that has this RS-45 connectivity. Uh, but uh, I think getting back to the actual question, does the gateway only take in RS-485? Uh, is there any other protocols? From, but from the discussion that you said, that the gateway only does take in RS-485, if you have 4 to 20 of PALS, you could use the field bus. Exactly that, it. yeah. So you'll have to connect it. We're only supporting RS-485 on the gateway. And uh, yeah, so if you do need to connect any third body or, or ad hoc type devices, mm -hmm. pressure sensors, level sensors, quality sensors, something like that, anything that has an analog output, yeah. you would have to use the field bus module. Okay. Exactly that. No, great. Um, I think that's about all the questions that we can, uh, that, that's been in the chat. Is there anybody that wants to um, unmute their mic and ask a, a question directly to us? Or well, uh, just raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Rob, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, my only question is with regards to the amount of tags that um, that the system can handle, it's 32 tags. Um, those tags, in what form is it? Is it a bullion, like a bit kind of tag? Or, or can we set up the tags as a word and then analyze it on a bit level in the cloud to sort of maximize the amount of data that, that, we, that, we, that, we, that we're reading? Okay, that's a, that's a, okay, thanks, man. That's a good question. Um, so in terms of the, the tag uh, uh, styles that we can, we can read, um, they'll have to be your generic, uh, like in 16, you in 16, 32 bits, um, that kind of stuff. Um, we can read bits as well. But in terms of sending a bit, yes, I guess you could send a 16 bit uh, to, to, uh, to a specific register and, and monitor 16 different uh, statuses or something like that in the bit form. Um, but yes, it's limited to 32 tags um, and anything around that. Yeah, if that answers the question. Maybe is there a question for that? Is there a developer mode that you can get into as well to, 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 to analyze certain data and uh, create it on the portal? Mm, so currently, no, there isn't uh, a way to do that. Um, through the, the generic Modbus device type, when you, if, you, if you use that as the, as the, 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 the device type that you want to use, um, you'll be able to set basically just a register that you want to read mm -hmm. and what format that register is going to reply to you. In. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of what that so is. So if there's anything outside the scope, we'd, we'd have to get in touch. Yes. Yeah, so I think that that's a good idea, man. If you, if that, if that's something outside the scope like that, maybe get in touch with us if you can. 
um, and uh, we can we can see what we can do there. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of the the, the thirty two bit limit, I kind of we we can add multiple uh, levels of subscriptions onto an actual uh, a single device, so we can see one or more. Uh, like say, if you wanted to monitor sixty two points through one gateway, we could then buy a second software licensing fee. Um, or alternatively, you can throw down a second gateway and actually uh, monitor it that way. Um, obviously, that just adds now then to the redundancy of the system as well. If there's some noise on the one, at least there's not noise on the other. Um, so those, yeah. So let's let's maybe take that one off off uh, off the side, and we can chat about that at, a, at another stage. Uh, Guy, you, uh, I see you got a question. Hi, Mike. Hi, Darren. Hi. How's it going? Hi. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I've tried to look back at some historic data, but uh, the information is not um, uh, doesn't make too much sense. So I presume one has to fiddle with the axes to to try and uh, correct that. I'll tell you what. What my problem is, the, the client wants to be able to know if there's been a voltage surge or dip or, or current. And then if there's consequences, in other words, if there was a motor burnt or something like that, um, he can then go to the supplier and, and claim some sort of insurance or some, some yeah. type of... So, okay, so thank you. Okay, so guy, yes. Yeah. So thank you for that question. That's actually a very good point to touch on here. Um, so this actually stems to a lot of different uh, 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 points that were raised out today in terms of how fast our data polling rates are, how fast we're obviously reading the data from the site. Um, this system is unfortunately not a scope. Okay, we are able to read what the controller can read. Okay, so in this event, like the client is now say looking for a spike in the data or a spike in voltage that was maybe a millisecond long. We obviously reading in five minute data points. Okay. So we cannot detect a spike like that. Okay. We're only as good as the controller that we are reading from. So in a situation like that, if you're trying to look for a spike in data, I would suggest say a power analyzer or something like that, that we can then read the minimum or the maximum voltage level from the controller directly. But Essentially, unless our system at its five minute poll interval was able to detect that voltage spike and were landed in that exact same split second that the voltage spike occurs, the chances are that you wouldn't see that on our actual cloud. The, it's important to reiterate here that the polar monitoring system is a tracking and trending system, not a scope or a PLC type system that's running on millisecond poll intervals. Okay, so unfortunately for this client, if you're having to try and look back and seeing where the voltage spike was, unless the controller can give that directly, we are not going to be able to show it on our side. Okay. Great. Um, I see there is a, a, another question that's come through here. So um, Juanita is asking, is the system only cloud-based or do you have a telemetry system? Okay. So in terms of um, uh, the cloud-based side, so yes, yeah, so we are only cloud-based. Okay. Our system is hosted on Microsoft Azure. Um, and we do not have any local type logging, um, right? So when, oh, sorry, okay. So with with that, um, there is no, so there's no local logging, the system's only on the cloud. And uh, if it does go down, to be honest, generally, because of the way that we're hosting this, we're not hosting it locally, that if we get hit by load shedding, it's gonna go off or something like that. It's hosted on Microsoft Azure. They're very, very good with their data retention and making sure that there's always good uptimes. Um, so I'm not too worried about the actual data side. Our biggest hurdle is generally the monitoring of the actual data and getting it to our cloud, which to be honest with our cell phone networks and the fact that we can roam onto any network hasn't really been a big issue um, on our side as well. Okay. I see you answered the last question. Um, yeah, sorry, I lost. Who is your cloud uh, service provider and what uptime do they, they guarantee? Okay, so Microsoft Azure obviously offers incredible uptimes. Um, to date, we, we generally go down pretty pretty rarely. I don't have an exact figure for you in terms of uptime percentages, um, but I'll tell you it's, 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 it's basically all the same. Okay, it's not obviously a perfect 100, but it's basically always online. Okay, 
Um, there, there will obviously be issues now and then that you're trying to log in and it's being a bit weird, but I mean, such as software in general. Um, and yeah, you're not going to have an issue, I can tell you that. Um, and if you do have an issue, you can definitely get in contact to, uh, with us and we'll obviously assist as much as we can. No, oh, great. And I see a last question from Marty is, uh, can a, use, a farmer use the data um, that he gets obviously from the telemetry system to reduce his water bill? Okay, so this is actually a lot of the, the, the systems that we used to do um, in, in Polar's uh, early days as well was exactly that. Um, it's difficult to know if you have a leak or something like that on the system or on your water line unless you're actually monitoring it, okay? It's one thing to go once a day and check the meter reading and see if there's a, 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 like what your consumption was, but how do you know what the, the, the say, the, the flow rate through the meter was at midnight or at 1 a.m. when you shouldn't really be reading water or getting water through the meter, right? So that's where the system really comes in play is that it can now start seeing, hey, wait a second, I've got a weird water reading or I'm actually using water at midnight or 1 a.m. Yeah. in the morning when there's nobody actually awake. True. So those are the kind of moments that this kind of stuff will help you detect those. And maybe you're not actually seeing the leak. Not all yeah. leaks are generally like water pouring out from under your paving mm. or something like that. It could be something that you never even see. True. Um, and uh, yeah, with the system, you can generally like now start seeing where those leaks, well, not really the detection of where the leaks are, but I can tell you that there is water being lost somewhere. Um, okay. Yeah, so we also, just to touch on a, a further point there, in the irrigation schemes, um, a lot of the time the government bills farmers on um, actual hectares of plantable land. And a lot of the time, obviously, you're not planting all of your land. Mm. So with these type of systems, you can now start monitoring exactly how much water you're pumping out of yeah. the river, how much water is actually going into your fields. And you can now start like optimizing the system to uh, to get the most out of your ads, really. Okay. okay. Oh, great. Um, so thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, it, it, uh, you know, there is a link that will be sent to you with the recording. If you have any other further questions, please don't hesitate to contact Electromechanica directly. Um, and we'll definitely support you with the system. And thank you once again for registering um, for this recording and see you next time. Ciao. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for your time.